Why do you think Twitter's, why do you think for you Twitter is so important? Because you seem to, it, this seems to be the place where a lot of these kind of political questions get. Yeah, Twitter isn't that important. No? No, not at all. I, I'm just childish and I engage with people that I should ignore. <laughs> And, and so people know if they come on Twitter. I think also because what it is, is because I've been doing the work I've been doing for so long, what happens is if people chat shit about men on Twitter, no, truthfully, there are kids who are in their 30s now, or 28, who I went to their school when they were 12. I was doing this before, it was cool, and everyone was saying, oh, I'm woke now. So there are, I'm not saying that means I can't be criticized, I'm just saying that there are lots of people who say, well, hold on a minute, before anyone was looking, before, everyone was on this cool wave, my mum was already coming to my school. We live in a world where if you don't post it on your Instagram, it didn't happen. If you do post it on your Instagram, you're showing off. And so a lot of the stuff I do, when I go to a prison, when I go to a school, I might post one in 15. But I'm not gonna be here every week saying, yo, I did this, I did that, oh, I'm working with this community organization, because I just think people know what I believe in. It should be a given. If you wanna believe that man's not on that, I don't, I don't really mind. But I think the Twitter thing, it, and social media in general, it lends itself to people feeling like they're doing something just by cussing other people. They haven't actually done anything themselves. They maybe not get any history of organizing. They maybe not all, they're not in Boardwater Farm organizing the UNM. If they were, I would have heard about it. But it gives people a platform and an access. Stormzy said something really, really wise about social media. And he said, you're not supposed to hear everyone's negative opinions of you, or positive. You're not supposed to get gassed because of all the positive, and you're not supposed to be affected by all the negative. For example, if I walk past someone in the street, and I'm dressed funky today. I've just left my house in my pajamas, right? And you thought in your head, well, I'm going for my man, is he smoking, right? You've said it in your head. Whereas Twitter allows people to say, oh, I think you're an ugly bastard, oh, I think you're this, or I think you're that, to your, to your face, but not to your face. And I think because of the way I grew up, you know, words had consequences. You, you talk too much shit, you'll get your head bust. So I don't understand, like, if you watch me on Twitter, even people that are rude to me, I'm generally not rude back to them. Because I think, if a man says turn on your locations, uh, uh, like, that's a big statement coming, like, come, growing up how we grew up, it, I'm not even saying it to laugh, like, it can get really sticky. Like, I've, I, I had a situation a few years ago, I won't name any names, but I had a situation a few years ago where, you know, another MC was rude to me over Twitter, and I was confused. Because I was like, what has given this guy the impression that in real life I won't say anything? Is there an, is there an energy I'm giving off that makes him think that? And then obviously when I saw him, he wanted to be my brethren again, and I was like, but cuz, see what you did, yeah? If I took you seriously, you're lucky. What he didn't even know is my brethren were phoning me like, cuz, I don't care what you say. When I see my man, it's on. Cause I can't, I'm not having that. Like he's, I'm oh, like, bruv, come on, it's, it's who it is. But, but I think Twitter lets lots of people think they're somebody they're not. And especially if they don't have, if their face ain't on Twitter, they're hiding behind, there's, there's one guy I was arguing with last week, he's hiding behind a picture of Vladimir Lenin. Anyone can, anyone can do that. Anyone can be radical on Twitter. And, and it's like when, when people talk that way about how super duper revolutionary they are on Twitter, the reason why I'm inclined not to take it that seriously, if I'm honest, if you were intending to do anything that jeopardized your safety, your freedom, potentially even your life, this is why when people say to me, why do you say you're not a revolutionary and others do? Because it's too easy. I can say that now knowing that the police are unlikely to shoot me dead in my bed like they did to Fred Hampton. So it's very easy to claim these kind of these tags right now, we, we're not living in 1960s America or 1990s South Africa. And I just think if people were that serious, to what extent would they be announcing their intentions to say, assassinate the heads of arms companies? Not that I'm promoting such things, officer. To what extent would they announce that on social media? And so I think social media can be really good. You can, you can, can be really productive. You, I'm just so, I've got a whole folder full of thousands of articles that have been sent on social media. Really good, if, if you notice like, oh, what I really do get complimented about and what keeps me on there is when I ask for a book list or I, I don't know, I say I want to know more about it. A couple of weeks ago, I said, uh, someone told me something about the age of the brain, the way that the brain doesn't become mature until 30. And I just said, oh, can someone tell me more about this? And I had like 50 scientists that follow me who was like, yo, hold this, hold this, hold this, hold this, hold this. And that's what I am complimented by, that I have a large amount of people who are fucking clever people, yeah, who actually care about and respect what I say, who Obviously challenge man, but challenge man from a place of intellect, which I like. And so that's what I suppose keeps me on there to some degree. Every time I feel like, I'm just gonna have a six month break off this nonsense. Something like that will happen, and I'll be able to get 50 good papers on the history of the brain at, at the click of a button and the ask of a question. I think, no, actually, for every one idiot on Twitter, 
there are like a thousand people who are actually interested in engaging in good faith. And so I discovered the mute button <laughs> about two months ago. And I feel like you lot all lied to me, man. Like, how could you let me be on there that long, engaging with that many? You've all been, some of you have been watching, and you didn't say, cuz, you know there's a mute button, yeah? You can just mute these people, because you don't want to give someone the satisfaction of blocking them. If you block them, then they know you block them, and they feel like they achieved something. If you mute them, they're just pissing in the wind. <laughs> and, and so I discovered the mute button, and life is wonderful again. Good. Good. And do you, have you found that people engage with you differently on Twitter now that your book's out, that people feel like they know you differently? Do people come at you in a different way? Um, no, I think what's been most revealing to me has not even been Twitter. The deafening silence of the right-wing press to a best-selling social history written by a guy who raps and wears a hoodie. They can cuss Raheem Sterling for buying his mum a house or for getting breakfast the day after he's lost a game, but they can't even produce a good critique. They haven't even reviewed it. Obviously, my publicist sent it to them all, the fact that the silence has been such a great compliment. I'm like, you man are actually shook. Like, you're idiots. I, I would rate you. Like, I could half respect you. In fact, I would respect you if you combed through it, you looked at the citations, and you produced a solid rebuttal of why I'm talking bollocks. I would actually respect them if they had the minerals to do it. The fact they have not done so tells you either they know that I'm broadly correct, maybe not every single instance is correct, but they know the broad statement that Britain is not a meritocracy, that the legacies of the British class system are still endemic, and the legacies of the British Empire are still endemic. That is not, does not mean Britain is the most unjust society in the world to live in. That is not my argument. My argument is specifically what I call the great British contradiction. That in some senses, Britain is quite a progressive country, which makes us supporting the Saudis and the other sets of people we do support even more ridiculous. Because in some senses, I mean, London is a great example of this. We have 400 languages in London. We do not have the kind of ethnically targeted violence that was common even 30 years ago, generally speaking. Let alone that is very common in many other polities around the world. And a lot of this is because Londoners have decided, cool, I might not like everybody, but broadly speaking, the power balance is fairly even. I mean, let's face it, who would go to Tower Hamlets today and think it would be a good idea to attack Bengalis? Not very smart. Who's gonna go to Peckham today and say, you know what I wanna do? Nigger bashing. Not very smart. Not gonna work out well for you. Um, and so I think part of it is that power balance, but part of it is that in some senses, Britain is progressive. But I suppose the point about, because I'm going off now, the point about the right-wing academics, I think that has been a real education to me in the sense that these people are really dishonest actors. Think about it, if I'd written a book that wasn't very good, that didn't have proper citations in it, that had sloppy arguments, oh, they would have torn me every which way from Sunday. But what they've done is they've had a good look and they've said, this is a bad example. If we attract too much attention to this, other men that don't pronounce their T's properly will start thinking they can have a go. Even worse, not just black youths, scousers, white youths from Liverpool who like this rap stuff, they might start thinking they can come on national TV in a woolly hat in the middle of the morning and have a political opinion. All of the plebs might suddenly start thinking that they have the right to learn how to use citations in their Word documents, right? Remember, my, I never went to uni. So even among black people, I do not come from the class of black people that generally become academics. That's nothing wrong with it, but in general, if you look at a disproportionate amount of black academics, usually there's an academic family. Generally, it's not kids who grew up on free school meals. Generally, it's not kids who grew up in single parent homes. Generally, there's, there's, there's a certain dad's a school teacher or whatever it is, right? And it's precisely what is dangerous is that people know I had certain experiences growing up. I'm not saying I had the worst upbringing because I had loads of positives too and I, and I, and I point that out. But these youths out here are on badness, I'm not, I'm not as different from them as some people in Britain would like me to be. And I, there's this new sort of undercurrent, the Pierce Morgan syndrome, where I'm just gonna smile now that you're here. I'm not actually gonna challenge you because I wanna be seen as intelligent and I don't wanna be embarrassed by someone like you. And I want to blow smoke up your ass and try and make you feel like you're not like the rest of the bad black boys. And if I was the kind of person that was into that, I would take that. But the truth is, everyone who grew up with me would be like, stop lying, fam. You made some of the same mistakes we did. You ain't that different, actually. You've just read a few more books. And so I think that's one of the things I'm trying to deal with in the book is that actually, with a few different wrong turns, a few of the mistakes I made at 15, if I got arrested, went to Felton, whole trajectory of my life becomes different. I'm just another black boy who went jail. That didn't happen. 
I, I had certain equipment I was given that could pull me away from some of my friends who were real naughty boys. They weren't on this hooligan stuff that we're seeing now. They were making money in the streets. Um, had I followed that path, I would never have done any of this. And luckily for me, I didn't. And it's ironic to me because the very people that you would think or that British society would say on paper would oppose me. Like when I started the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company, do you know how many journalists said to me, have you lost any street cred because of this? And I thought, <laughs> what kind of a plum uses the word street cred unironically, <laughs> firstly? And secondly, like I said, the mandem was like, right, that's sick. Like, yeah, you've, you've like, and by mandem, I mean, broadly speaking, working class communities across the country. I did a project in Moss Side and Home in Manchester. And it was Manchester, so it was young kids of all ethnicities from toughest parts of Manchester. And by the end of two weeks, they did a production at the Lowry that we guided them to do. And precisely because I wasn't coming at them with, basically I wasn't coming at them like I was a posh missionary. The Shakespeare, I'm bringing it in to civilize you. It was just like, yo, I actually think my man's a good storyteller. And I think if you look at the rhythm, the way he uses words and language, like he's a great storyteller. And I think that that's really interesting. Like, that's another thing that I learned doing the hip hop Shakespeare work and seeing the way some people should have reacted to it positively, didn't. And the people who supposedly should have reacted to it negatively were sort of on board for it. And so I think all of those are sort of epiphany moments that some of my fundamental convictions were correct. Last point I'll make on this, and I promise. My African history lecture that I did at um, Oxford, I don't know if you've watched it, but I did that lecture in Birmingham prison for like five years in a row before I did it at Oxford. And what's fascinating is I got asked far more intelligent questions <laughs> in Birmingham prison. And I'm talking, anyone who knows Birmingham, like Winston Green, this is burger bars and Johnny's, like it's real shit. So I'm getting asked more intelligent questions by a man in jail for double murder than I got asked from the elite of this country. I mean, the first question, if you watch the video, was why can't white people say nigger? And I just thought, I've just given you 10,000 years of African history. <laughs> And that's the first question. And you're like the brightest and best of this country. No offense to the young lady who asked the question, you know, because I don't want to pick on her, but I think it's, a bro it's broadly indicative of the way the sage DMX puts it. There's a difference between doing wrong and being wrong. And, and I think one of the things I had growing up was that I had really positive educational influences coming first of all from my godfather, Uncle Offs, who's here tonight, who is a man's man, someone you always wanted to be like, strong, honorable. But let's be real, you're a young boy growing up, you always knew he would knock you out, yeah? And that does make a difference. But then I also had uncles who were not like Uncle Offs, who were criminals and gangsters. But yet, I always, firstly I saw, they all respected Uncle Offs, most out of everyone. So that made me look, hold on, hold on. You lot have got loads of money. You drive Range Rovers and Audis and whatever else, but this is the person you respect, one. Two, they, there used to be this thing I did when I was young. I was really into the theory of evolution. And so I'd recite Australopithecus, evolved from Homo erectus at whatever age, right? And my mum's gangster friends, friends of the family, uncles, they'd pay me five pounds, like another bridegroom would come around the house and they'd be like, give me a five, and I'd say, tell him that thing again. And I'd stand there as a six-year-old going, Australopithecine evolved from Homo erectus. And, and so you've got, imagine these big, hard, Cockney man them gangsters laughing like, and praising a six-year-old for knowing the fear of evolution. And so that early, really positive reinforcement, not just from Pan-African Saturday School, but from my uncles, from the men in my life, it, never, it meant that I never associated being clever with being effeminate. Or with being, and not that there's anything wrong with being effeminate, but you know what I mean? And lots of young boys grow up with this idea that somehow if they're too clever or too well-spoken, if it's working class white boys, they'll be like, ah, oh, don't be so posh. If it's working class black boys, it becomes, why are you trying to be white? What they really mean is, why are you trying to be posh? They just say white, because they've been taught to associate whiteness with poshness. But they got a white boy on their block who's not posh. So what they really mean is poshness, right? And they associate that with being soft. I never had that problem, because I had men around me, A, that were very, very clever, and B, that gave me that positive reinforcement. And now that's why, when I, as I've got older, on top of that, Jamaican dancehall. I posted a song today on my, on my Twitter because of this. You might remember that Bounty Killer song, Book, 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 right? And I forget how much, even dancehall, negative dancehall, man was still promoting, no, you have to go to school though. Be a bad man if you're gonna be a bad man, drop out of school and kill man. But if you're gonna stay in school, get your books. And so I grew up still with that very Jamaican contradiction of, if you're a bad man, be bad. But don't go to school and be bad. Go to school and study. 